Right. Hello. Sorry for being a bit late. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to give you a chance to ask any homework questions you might have um, or any review questions you might have um, from studying for the exam. Um, so if you have any questions that you want to ask first, let me know and then we can look at them. Any questions? You can either put it in the chat box. Um, all right, take your, that, that's okay. Um, yeah, take your time. Just um, um, one quiz grade will be dropped um, at the end. All right, I am not saying that. Um, so let me open my web assign and then take a look at the question. Correct, Sam. Um, just one homework grade will be dropped. Um, let me make sure I'm still sharing the screen. Stop sharing. Um, Sorry, we have a bit slow beginning today. Oh, we got two hours. Um, number two, integrate x minus nine sine pi x. All right, that's a all right. Ryan and I can go through that one. Uh, let me load the website. Judy has a question. All right, let's see. Okay, um, all right, so that's a couple of questions. Let me go through them first. So the first question was from um, Ryan. So it's a question about integrating. So we are integrating um, x minus nine sine x x. Um, so this one we're going to use integration by parts. So here's two parts. One is x minus sine minus nine. The other one is sine pi x dx. Um, so I'm just going to treat x minus 9 like x or x squared. So we're going to let u, at least try with that, let u equals x minus 9 du, we can solve, which is dx. dv will be the remaining part, which is sine pi x dx. And then v, we integrate sine pi x dx. Um, if we do that, the, you might have to use um, U substitution for the, so when you integrate this, you might want to call this part U. Um, I'm gonna do it a little bit quickly by skipping the, the steps there. Um, so the antiderivative sine is negative cosine. So that will be negative cosine pi X. 
but because I have a pi times x inside the cosine, so that gave me a constant pi when I differentiate. So now I have to un kind of balance that constant pi. So I'm going to have one over pi. So I get minus one over pi cosine pi x. I can check. So if I differentiate this, I should get sine pi x. Um, if you're not sure, just double check that. The integration by process, if we integrate u dv, so that will be u v minus v du integral. So we have u is x minus 9. So this becomes x minus 9 times v negative 1 over pi cosine pi x minus integral v, which is negative 1 over pi cosine pi x um, du, which is just dx. And then the first term you can simplify by pulling out negative 1 over pi x minus 9 stays in parentheses. And then we have cosine pi x. And in the middle, we pull out negative 1 over pi. So we can become positive 1 over pi, integrating cosine pi x dx. And here, when we integrate cosine pi x dx, we're going to follow the same pattern we did earlier when we integrate sine pi x dx. So the antiderivative of cosine, which is sine pi x, but then if we differentiate sine pi x, I get a pi as a constant. So I have to balance that. So I'm going to add a 1 over pi. That becomes the antiderivative of this plus a constant c. Obviously, you can add it later. So now we just have negative 1 over pi x minus 9 cosine pi x. Um, and then we have 1 over pi and another 1 over pi. So we get 1 over plus 1 over pi squared, and then sine pi x plus a constant c. So that's that homework question. Um, Julie has a question. So it's integrating, why is it negative? Let's solve this, but why is it negative? Maybe confused with this. All right, so here's a question similar to what um, what was asked last time by Sam. Um, I'm going to do it a little bit quickly. So you're integrating from 0 to 8 pi, just like 0 to 6 pi. Um, so um, you get t squared sine 2t dt. So, so here you have to use integration twice, right? The, you set u equals t squared, du equals 2t dt. And then we have um, dv equals sine 2t dt. And the v will become basically similar to what we had earlier. We get negative 1 half um, cosine 2t, I believe. And then the first step will give us t squared. And then minus one half cosine, so minus one half cosine two t. Um, that's being evaluated from zero to eight pi minus v du, so minus minus half integrating cosine two t. I bring the negative half in front, and then du have two t dt, so that's a t dt with a two in front, so two and a half will cancel. Give me one negative negative become a positive this is again from zero to eight pi in this example but it's the same function so that's a negative one half t squared cosine two t um i hope you i'm, I'm just going to leave this for now i'm not going to work on that first part and i'm going to just write positive one that's what those constants give me um, when I integrate 0 to 8 pi cosine 2t dt, uh, t dt, I have to use integration by pause again. So let u equals t, d u equals dt, and the dv equals cosine 2t dt. And the v, when we integrate that, will be sine 
two t with a half. This integral here will become t one half sine two t, um, and then I'm minus integrating um, v, which is one half sine two t, and then dt. This part I can do it quickly here. Um, so that will be negative one half cosine two t. So we evaluate everything at from zero. Um, yeah, we can look at that in a second. Um, so let me finish this. So this is uh, I'm just going to now bring everything to the same line. So I get negative one half t squared cosine two t from the first term. And then I have plus one half t sine two t from this, um, this the, the the second integral. That's the first term up there, and then minus um, one half times the negative half. So plus um, what do I have? Minus one half times negative one half. So positive one fourth cosine two t. And then we evaluate this from zero to eight pi. Good. Um, um, did you catch the mistake there, um, Julie, or should I continue to finish it? Okay. Um, okay, great. So I'm not gonna finish it. So the rest, just be careful when you plug in eight pi and uh, plug in zero, right? So just remember that cosine, um, I think that'll give you 16 pi. That's the same thing as cosine two pi, which is the same thing as cosine zero, just one. And then sine of even pi, like even number times pi, that's always gonna be zero. I'll put all sine zero. Just be careful there, good. Excellent, so I'm not gonna finish it, but plug in numbers careful there. So, excellent. So the next question is, um, we're integrating from zero to one of x squared plus one times e to the minus x dx. Right. So here I'm going to um, I'm going to try to follow what I did earlier because in this part I have a, a x squared term times the e term, right? That is sort of like um, like a sort of like a t squared term times sine term. Um, the, at least to me, the the t squared looks like an x squared plus one. And then the sine 2t looks like an e to the negative x term that, that's similar. So I'm going to follow what I did earlier by setting u to be the x squared plus 1 term. So u equals x squared plus 1, du equals 2x dx, and then dv equals e to the minus x dx. So v, when I integrate e to the minus x dx, now, the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? So here I have e to the negative x. So I'm going to try, I'm going to say, okay, the, the antiderivative looks like it could be e to the negative x. But if I differentiate this, I'm going to erase this in a second. So if I differentiate this, I have e to the minus x, but then I have to differentiate from negative one. If I get negative, if you flip them, you get the same answer. Oh, okay. So Sam said, you know, if we set um um, I guess if you set u equals e to the minus x, v equals um, dv equals x plus one x squared plus one dx. I did not try that, so I'm not sure. I, I suppose, I don't know. Um, so it, it's good if it, you get the same. So here I have an extra minus, so I'm going to add a negative one there. 
right? So now if I have x to negative, when I differentiate, I get negative, negative, that becomes positive e to the minus x, so that works. So that's V, and then now I can put in there using integration by parts. So this becomes uh, U X squared plus one times V, which is negative E to the negative X, evaluate it from zero to one. And then minus V integral V, which is negative E to the negative X, DU two X DX. So I'm gonna bring out negative, bring out two, um, so that's negative. So the first, so the first term, there's not much I can do. I'm going to leave it there. The the middle, the second term, I have negative times negative two. So that's a positive two integrating uh, x e to the minus x dx. From here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to again, I'm going to let u equals x, just like I let u equals x squared plus one earlier. Du equals dx. Dv equals e to the minus x. Dx. Again, v is the same as before, right? In this case, because we're integrating e to the minus x again, so I'm just going to write down negative e to the negative x from previous step. Um, and then this, just the integral, I'm not taking the two, just the integral part, that becomes uv, so that's a negative x e to the negative x minus integral v negative e to the negative x du dx. So just focus on the integral there. So that's a negative x e to the negative x. I forgot that to add the, the boundaries. That again, that's from zero to one for x value plus integrating the negative negative become positive, integrating e to the minus x. So that's a negative e to the minus x. And again, we evaluate from zero to one. So if I put everything together in the same line, I get negative x squared plus one e to the negative x. And then, oh, remember I had a two earlier. Don't forget I had a two that I took out. So two times everything, right? That's a factor. So I have plus two times negative x e to the minus x. Ah, good question. I'll explain it in a second. Minus e to the minus x. So why is it the second negative, uh, second e negative? Would that would it be wouldn't it be positive? Um. So let me write down the steps that I skipped. So from here, I have minus integral inside has a negative, right? So what I did is I took out the negative, and then write it as positive integrating e to the minus x dx. And then when I integrate e to the minus dx, minus x dx, if you recall earlier, we always end up with a negative in front of it. We can just integrate that. So this becomes the negative, the integral of e. Uh, maybe I should try this. So the integral of e to the negative x is actually negative e to the minus x. So that's why the uh, let's take e negative. Maybe I'm missing this. Um, Daniel, did I? I feel like I didn't address your question. I'm um, now looking back. Um, which second? Oh, you got it. Okay, good. I want to show which um, negative. Oh yeah, you probably talk about the one I box in blue. Okay. So now we evaluate everything from zero to one. So you just plug in one there, be careful. So you get negative one squared is one, one plus one is two, e to the minus one, and then plus two times negative one e to the, so that's a negative e to the negative one, and then a minus e to the negative one. Um, and then a minus plug in zero in there. So the x squared becomes zero, so that's a negative one, e to the negative zero, which is just one, plus two times negative. Um, x is zero, so that term goes away. So the first term in the parentheses goes away. Um, the second term give you negative e to the negative zero. Uh, e to the zero is one. 
and the e to the negative one is uh, probably just better to keep it as negative one, right? Um, so what do we end up with is negative two e to the minus one, two times, now we have two of them. So negative, negative becomes still negative, but twice. So, so that's a, this is a negative two e to the negative one, but I have a two in front. So that's a negative four e to the negative one. And then minus in the print in the bracket, I have minus one plus two times negative one. I feel like I probably made a mistake. Hopefully I didn't. Um, so that'll give you negative six e to the minus one minus negative three plus three. So double check. I'm not sure if I made a mistake somewhere, but uh, um, if you if you begin with the same expression I did, um, double check my answer there. But I guess the question is make sure the process right the how to solve this problem um, makes sense to you. It's really similar to the earlier question when we had a t square and a sine two t because you just you basically have to use integration by by pass twice. I have a quick question. Yep, go ahead. So if the dv was e to the negative 2x, um, would, it, would the v be uh, negative e over 2, negative 2x? So the question is, if dv is e to the, say it again, negative 2x? Yeah. dx, when you integrate that, now we're going to assume it's, it's in the form of e to the negative 2x, right? But if I differentiate this, I'm gonna erase this in a second. If I differentiate this, I get e to the negative 2x, but then that will give me a negative two as a constant from the exponent. So now I, I don't want anything there. So I have to, when I differentiate, I just want e to the negative 2x. So I have to undo the sort of, somehow cancel out the negative two, so I get negative one half. that negative one half will balance out the negative two when I differentiate. That kind of makes sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, any other questions about homework or review? I think I addressed every question asked. Let's make sure I didn't skip any. Okay, it's a new question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say probably, um, probably make sure that the process is right, Chris. Um, so Chris had a similar question. I guess the same question, but begin with a different constant um, in the function. Um, so I would say, you know, double check, make sure the, the process is similar. Um, if you did everything I did, and then, then I can take a look at your work maybe um, a little bit later. And, uh, and then I'll try to identify um, which, step you, which step you got it wrong. I just have one more quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is the antiderivative of secant squared x tangent x? Correct. So if you integrate secant squared x to the x, that's going to be tangent x. And uh, on the, a similar integral is if you integrate secant x tangent x, x so that will give you secant x any other questions
All right, some of you probably have not um, finished all the homework yet. Um, it's, um, if you have questions and then you have not looked all, look at all of them yet, or if, um, if you don't want to ask them here, um, you know, you can email me. I have office hours tomorrow. Um, or, you know, you can bring into lecture tomorrow. Again, we're going to spend probably 25 minutes, 30 minutes um, to, to, um, to go over any final questions you might have about when you, when you review for the exam. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, we don't have one hour, right? We just have about half an hour uh, to review. Um, and, uh, yeah. And... Uh, and then I'll give you the exam. I'll make sure that you have 90 minutes, one, one hour and a half to just work on the exam part. Um, and then after that, you get another 10 minutes. Um, just like a quiz, you get additional 10 minutes to, um, to scan your work, um, upload it. Um, the multiple questions, so chances that you're going to use multiple pages on your notebook. So please scan them as one PDF file that has multiple pages. Don't scan as separate files. Right, just one file, uh, which you have done at the very beginning with the with the you know the, the quiz zero, scanning five pages. So it doesn't matter how many pages, you can always scan it as safe as one PDF. Um, so next week homework will be posted tomorrow. Yeah, I was thinking about posting it today, but I felt like it probably um, make more sense to post it later. So yes, I'll post another homework assignment that will be due next week. Um, that way you can work on it. Um, after the exam. Um, I, it's not going to be very long. Um, it's a, just a short homework because um, we don't have a lot this week. All right. Um, so that was that. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have one last um, general question about um, integration by parts. So what's the best method to know which one to set as um, U and DV? Um, it depends on the example. Um, all the examples we seen, like that was asked earlier, they all have the form of you know like some linear or quadratic part of x, um, and then then you have a sine term or we with an e term. So if you have something like this, I always look at it as um, integrating x to a m power of f of x dx. That's what they look like to me. So I always set u equals x part. Because when you say u equals x, then du will become dx or x times dx. So the power of x term will reduce by one each time you use integration by parts. Um, another hint to consider is that you look at sine, like for now we have sine, right? Next, the last example, we had a e to the negative x. When you have those terms, it's always associated that with, um, with dv. Because when you integrate them, you basically end up with the same function. Like in, when you integrate e to the negative x, you get e to the negative x with a constant, right? So basically it's the same. When you integrate sine, you get cosine, but cosine is really not different from sine. If you integrate that again, you get sine back, right? So when you have a sine, and the cosine or e raised to some x function, um, usually that goes with dv. Um, usually, not not one hundred percent, but uh, um, it depends. Really depends. Sometimes you might have um, in the, you might have. Um, I think we did one example. If you integrate x sine x e to the x dx or something like this. In this case, you get three functions, right? So what do we do? Well, um, I don't know. Maybe you can try to put e x sine x together as a u, or you can put x and the e to the x together. I don't think it's going to make much difference. Um, but you wouldn't put um, you wouldn't put sine x e x as a v, so so sorry dv dv if you set dv equals sine x 
e to the x. That's a bad a bad choice because um, we don't know how to integrate this together, right? I mean, you could integrate it by using integration by parts, but then that's going to take more time. Um, it's not impossible. It still works if you try to use integration by parts. It's just going to take more, uh, more steps, I suppose. You know what? Let me take it back. Actually, I think it's about the same amount of work if you set, x, set u equals x sine x or x times e to the x. I don't think it's going to make much difference there. I, I withdraw what I said. Um, but anyway, so, so if you have something like this, you just have to pick which two to set as u. Try it. Um, and the, if you cannot make any progress, you try something else. Good question, but I wish I had a more clear answer to that. Um, any other questions? All right, so here's one question that I prepared. Um, this, this is from very early on when we talk about fundamental theorem of calculus as part one and a part two. Part one is, um, is basically saying that if you have g of x is equal to integral of a to x, um, f of t dt. There's a few conditions there, but generally speaking, if you have this, then um, g prime of x is just equal to f of x. You take the f of t, replace the t with x. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus one says. Right? But you always have to make sure that you, in the integral, has an a as a lower bound and the x as an upper bound. a is a constant. So, for example, the example here I prepared. Um, I have lower bound is x, the upper bound is three, so I cannot apply the rule directly. So I have to rewrite it by flipping the, in, the boundaries of the integral to become a negative three to x, and then everything stays the same. And then now, if you want to find the derivative of g prime of x, you just take the f of t, other than, don't forget the negative. Um, negative x squared, square root x to the fourth plus 21 x squared. So that's fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, the next one is, the second one, it basically is just Definite integral, right? You find the antiderivative and then you're going to plug in the, the upper bound and then I'll subtract the expression you get when you plug in the lower bound. I'm not going to work out this example. I don't think it's that challenging. Uh, if you want, you can try it later. Um, the next one is the example that we haven't really touched on, but it's same thing. Um, for example, here, given g of x is integral from 0 to x squared of 3t squared dt, looks like we're going to have to use fundamental theorem of calculus part 1. But we're not looking for the derivative, so we're not going to apply that rule. We're just looking for g of 1. So we have g of x is given by this integral. So what is g of 1? Well, can we just plug in 1 directly for x? Why not, right? Let's try plugging 1 directly here. So that's a 0 to 1 squared, which is 1, 3t squared dt. And do you know how to find this? I'm sure you do. So this is where you use the find the antiderivative, plug in the upper bound and lower bound, and evaluate. So again, I'm not going to figure out that step there. I just want to show you this. Now, what about g of zero? Same thing. You just replace x with a zero, so you get integral zero to zero, 
3t squared dt. And then if you want, you can find the antiderivative and the follow, you know, carry out all the steps. But if you recall, there's a one um, property with definite integrals we talked about a long time ago. What is integrating from zero to zero give you of some function? You should immediately know what that number is, right? Um, doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be from zero to zero, it could be from A to A for some constant A. So again, I'm not gonna carry out this, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but you should know what that is. Um, just a zero, exactly. Not because of zero, zero at the lower and upper bound. Well, let me take, take it back. Not because of the value of the lower bound and upper bound, and upper bounds are zero. It's because they are the same value, right? So when you when you have lower and upper bound that are exactly the same, you always end up, end up with a zero. You can think about that's like an area. So this is the f of x. If you if I find the area below the curve from a to a, well, it's just a line, a line, a vertical line doesn't have an area. Right? So that's why the, it's a zero. All right, um, any questions on that? So all we do for the um, g of one and g of zero, all we have to do is find the integral and, um, and plug in the bounds? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just kind of like another way to see um, evaluate this definite integral, right? So this, this is what we call a definite integral because we know the lower and upper bounds. So if we just say evaluate this definite integral, that's what we do. But the example, so I'm taking an extra step, you know, it gives you g of x, it's defined as the integral with the x in it. So how do we find g of one? Well, we know x is one, just plug in x, one for x first and then evaluate the integral like you always do. Okay. Uh, um, any other questions? If you want more practice problems on this part, on this example, I think you have to go to uh, 5.3, that's the very first section we did, or 5.4, I think it's 5.3 or 4. When we talk about um, definite integrals or fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, um, any other questions before we move on? The next thing I want to do, I want to finish what we didn't finish last time uh, with trig substitution. Um, it's, it was confusing. I just want to do two more examples um, that are a little bit more difficult than what we went through last time, but it's same same strategy. Um, any questions before, um, before we talk about it? All right, um, I'm just gonna begin with this, this example. So here we're integrating um, a square root of 4x squared minus 25 divided by x dx. So here we have a, a square root, even though there's a four there, but it still looks like a square root of x squared minus a squared example. That's one of the case we had last time. Um, but before I do anything, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, Back out a four from the square root part, that becomes, I just don't like the four in front of x squared, so I'm going to take out a four, 
of x squared, then the take out of 4 from 25, so that would be 25 over 4, divide by x, dx, and to continue this, take out the square root of 4, which is 2, so I can bring the 2 outside of the interval, so that's 2 integrating square root x squared minus 25 over 4, that's 5 half squared divided by x dx. You probably don't like 5 half, but to me, I, I see this as a as an easier, uh, it looks similar to what we did. So here, notice that we have square root of x squared minus a squared, where a equals 5 half. Right? And if we have this, I'm going to draw a right triangle. I'm going to call this theta. I'm going to call this x. And I'm going to call this part A. I see that's what we did. And then from here, I can write cosine theta equals A over X. So the if I flip both sides, I get secant theta on the left equals X over A. Um, good question. So Couple, so where does the two come from? So this two here, so what I did is I have a square root of four times something. So I can rewrite this as the square root of four times square root of x squared minus 25 over four. And then the square root of four becomes a two in front of the square root. Then I bring the two all the way in front of, um, so that becomes two square root of x squared minus 25 over four. Then I bring the two all the way in front of the, the, the integral. Um, is this the second case? I believe it is. To be honest with you, I don't remember which rule, which uh, which case it was. Um, yes, x squared minus a squared. Correct. So that's the second case. No. And then from here. I'm going to just rewrite it. So I have secant theta x over a, then I can write as x equals a times secant theta. And in this, that, that will be the substitution we're going to use. But in this example, a is 5 half, so I'm going to write as x equals 5 half secant theta. So that's what I'm going to use for substitution for x. And then I can immediately solve for dx, which is 5 half derivative of secant, which is secant theta tangent theta d theta. So that will be, that will be, that's what we're going to use to substitute for dx later on. So now we have those parts. I can go to my integral. Recall I have a 2 in front. So I'm going to leave the 2, don't even bother with it. And I'm integrating. Um, I'm going to use a black color, not purple. So I get 2 integrating square root. Uh, maybe I should figure out this part first. Um, if I do that, sorry, um, I'll plug in later. So, so let's just focus on the square root part. So we got square root of underneath the square root. I got x squared minus 5 half squared. So I'm going to plug in x. So that's a uh, 5 half secant theta squared minus 5 half squared. So that gave me 5 half squared from the first part. That's 25 over 4. Then I have a secant squared minus 5 half squared. So if I take out 5 half squared, I get secant squared minus 1, which is you can write as 25 over 4, doesn't matter. I'm just going to write as 5 half squared times tangent squared. Use, that's the that's, uh, identity we use to, um, so it's tangent squared equals secant squared minus 1. Now I can take the square root of this. So that's a square root of 5 half squared tangent squared. So that will be just 5 half tangent theta. 
I'm going to assume it's positive here. Um, so now I can go back to the integral for real this time. Um, how do we get secant squared minus one? Um, so what I did is, um, I was skipping a couple of steps. So from here, I get five over two squared secant squared and the minus five over two squared. And then I take out five over two squared from the green expression that will give me a secant squared from the first term and the one from the next, the second term. Good question. And then for this part, I just use the identity that's equals tangent squared. So the next step is taking the integral and the substitute for x, substitute for the squared root part as well as, 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 well as uh, dx. But recall that we had a two in front and so the two stays integral. The square root becomes five half tangent theta. Um, that's the square root. And then the denominator, we have x, which is five half secant theta. And then the dx will give us five half. I know that's a lot of five half, but you know they're all the same, right? So as long as you keep track of them, um, you should be okay. Um, secant theta, tangent theta theta. So now I'm going to simplify a few terms. So five half, I'm going to cross it out. Secant, cross it out. So I just have um, tangent. But in front, I have a two. So I'm going to bring five half in front as well. So I get two times five half. That's a five. Integrating tangent times tangent. So tangent squared. Theta, d theta. And you probably wonder how do we integrate this. Um, one thing we could try is we could rewrite tangent squared as secant squared minus one like we have done earlier, d theta. So now we can integrate each one of them um, separately. So that's a five times integral of tangent squared, sorry, inter integral of secant squared that's just tangent, sorry, that's a theta. And the integral minus one, that's a negative theta and the plus a C. Any questions about what I did to get to this point? We're not done yet with this example. Uh, this is still a few more steps to go, but we're close. How did you know to have secant in your x in the first place? Like, uh, like uh, the, the setting x equals five half secant. But I guess yeah, the a times secant. Uh, that you can try to memorize. So, it's it's that that substitution coming from the in the original the given integral. We have this sort of x squared minus a squared in the square root. We have this form. So that's the substitution we're gonna use. If we have a different form, if we don't have x squared minus a squared, if we have x squared plus a squared, we wouldn't use this. We would use something different. Um, so you can either remember that kind of connection, that association directly, um, or you can just think about every time, the, another technique that people use is that every time you have a square root of x squared minus a squared, you immediately draw a right triangle with, um, with x being the hypotenuse and a being the adjacent leg. You can draw that right triangle and from there, you can derive that substitution directly. Um, eventually, if you end up with here. So, um, so it's up to you which one you try to remember directly. Anyway, either case, you're gonna use the right triangle later. Sorry, I wish there's like a, 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 a better explanation, but I'm just not sure how to um, explain. No, I, I see, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's just, just think about this as that's like a, you know, like rules that people come up with after many years. Um, is this on the exam? No, um, this, this will not be on the exam tomorrow. 
So 7.3 is not on the exam. All right. So from here, we haven't finished yet because we end up with a antiderivative that's in terms of uh, theta, but the original integral is in terms of x, right? So we have to rewrite this using x there. Well, the connection between x and the theta is the right triangle I had. So that's what we're going to use to rewrite theta in terms of x. So I have theta here, I have x here, I have a here, and this leg is x squared minus a squared. Right, and then I'm just going to use the the three sides of the right triangle under the angle there to find tangent. So from the right triangle, I know that tangent theta, which is opposite of adjacent, that's a square root of x squared minus. Um, oh, sorry, it shouldn't be a. A is five half. So that's a five half squared, twenty five over four. This is five half. So that's uh, x squared minus 25 over 4 over 5 half. That's what tangent theta is. You can rewrite as 2 over 5 square root. Da, da, da. Okay. That's a tangent theta. How about theta? Well, earlier we had, so recall we had cosine a over x. Is, sorry, that's cosine theta is a over x. So recall cosine theta is a over x, that's 5 half over x, call 5 over 2x if you like. And then I can solve for theta. So theta equals inverse cosine of 5 over 2x. That's how we get theta directly. I mean, you could see, can we just use inverse tangent? Nothing wrong with it. You can you can use inverse tangent, but I'm just saying you know. So here I'm going to use um, theta as using the inverse cosine to find theta. So the last step is just rewrite it. So that's a five bracket um, two over five square root x squared minus twenty five over four. That's the tangent theta minus um, inverse cosine of five over two x and the plus a constant c. So now we get an antiderivative in terms of x there. Of course, you could distribute the five and then simplify the first term. Um, so there's two squared root. So we can use cosine secant or anything we would on for this problem. Um, at the end, it really doesn't matter which one you use when you substitute for theta. Um, it doesn't really matter, but you know, you just find the easy one, right? So obviously, if you try to use inverse tangent, you just have a square root inside the inverse tangent, which is not nice. So it's probably better to use um, x and a five half to find theta because you know the shorter expressions. Um, you can also try use sine, but sine has the square root, and also have x in the denominator. Um, pick the one that's easy, um, simpler. Let's put it that way. Um, any other question? How did you go from the five over two tan theta to the integral part right after that? From where we like found five over two tan theta from the entire top equation to plugging it into the integral. Oh, from here. Um, I suppose you meant this part, right? Yeah. So I, I so what I did is that the next step. So after I so what I did is I had an x equals five over two secant, and I found dx, and I also found the square root, um, x squared minus five half squared. So I found all those three parts. Then I just shove it into the integral that I had earlier. 
well, the one with the, the one boxed in red now. So I go back to the integral and the substitute for all the terms with x there. So I substitute for the x in the denominator, the square root in the numerator, and also the dx on the right with those three expressions with theta there. That's what I get. I get a two integral under those terms. So you're plugging in 5 over 2 tan theta into x in that integral equation? The 5 over 2 tan theta, that's, that's the square root part. So the entire square root expression, that's 5 over 2 tan theta. Okay. And the, the x in the denominator in the integral, the x in the denominator, that I use 5 half secant theta for x. All right, that's this example. Any other questions? So essentially what we do here is we find all the variables that are given in the original problem, and then we solve for the integral after we find like dx and x, like all the variables that are originally in the problem. Correct. So, right, so, so the, the part of the work, you're right. It just, we, we use the substitution for x, when we find the dx and we find the square root with the x in it in terms of the new variable theta, right? And then we're going to substitute for all the x terms in integral and get an integral with theta there. Then we integrate with respect to theta, the new variable. So this is, a, so this is like the first part, all the prep work there. And then this is like the second part, you only work with um, functions of theta. Um, and using trig identity if you need to. And then after you've done that, you have to go back to use the, you know, the, the relationship you used earlier, the, the x and the theta. Basically, that's what this um, right triangle is. Then you go back and the, rewrite the antiderivative you found using x, the three parts. So. This is a kind of like what we did, if you think about it, it's sort of like a, the u substitution we did, except that the u substitution is just, we let something equals u, and then integrate in terms of u function, du, and then we substitute for, substitute the, for the u part at the very end, right? So it's the same process here, just not, instead of using a u, we have to find the x in terms of some function with theta. Um, Right, and then I work with theta there, and then at the end, turn everything into x. It just in this type of questions, it's a little bit more challenging. So to find five half ten, you take five half common, and you get secants, which become ten squared. Um, all right, the one I highlighted. So, um, so what I did is that, so obviously I found the, I work out, work out the X part, right? I find out the X in terms of theta. And then what I did is I go back to the square root part. So I found out the, the x squared minus 5 half by directly substituting for x in that part. Um, and then I simplify, right, using the, the, the tangent square equals secant square minus 1 identity. Eventually, I end up with 5 half squared, 10 squared theta. And then I have to take a square root because in the integral, I have a square root of x squared minus 5 half squared. So I basically using the x I found to rewrite the square root part first to get it out of the way. Um, okay. Good. 
All right, I'm going to go through another example. Um, it's similar, but it's, um, I need, let me give myself more room here. I'm sort of all over the places now. Um, I'm going to put it at the end of this um, page. So this is a second example of trig substitution. Um, so here I have, um, if you look at it, I have an x cubed in the in the denominator. I have a square root x squared. Oh, that shouldn't be square root. I just um, made a mistake. So what I meant is to have this function. So I just have um, x cubed in the numerator, and, and then, then I have x squared plus 9, 3 half in the denominator. So it looks like we don't have a square root, but we do. So that's why I had a square root earlier. So if we have this, we're just going to rewrite it as integral from 0 to 1 x cubed denominator we have square root that's coming from the half in the denom in the exponent there so that's a square root of x squared plus nine cubed that's what the three does is cubed but then the three i can put it outside it doesn't have to be um in the square root that could be outside of the square root so that's the x squared plus nine to the three half means so i still have a square root of x squared plus nine dx so even though in the given integral it looks like we don't have a square root we do because of the the half in the exponent of the denominator there so now in the denominator i have this form so notice we have This is square root of x squared plus 9, which is 3 squared, which is x squared plus a squared. Then we can draw a right triangle. This is, if we call this theta. And in this form, when we have a square root of x squared plus 3 squared, we're going to label the opposite side as x. And then we're going to call this adjacent leg three. So why isn't it to the three half anymore? Um, because of, yeah, right, the half becomes square root. Um, so the, the, we're going to assign the, the, the legs in this form with x opposite from theta. Then we can solve for, then we can find tangent theta, which is x over three. Correct. I think this is a case one or case three, different from the previous case. Sorry, I don't remember which one it is. Um, so from this form, immediately I'm going to draw this um, right triangle. And from there, I can find tangent theta. So I can solve for x, which is three tangent theta. So that's good substitution, right, for, for x. And then I can find dx, which is three secant squared theta d theta. Again, that's very useful. That's what we're going to need. So we need those two. So now I'm going to go to the integral. I have a square root of x squared plus nine. So I'm going to find the square root first to make it easy to substitute for the, um, into the integral later. So I'm going to just take a couple of steps. So x squared plus nine, that becomes three tangent theta squared plus nine so that's uh i'm going to do a couple of steps that's a uh, nine tangent squared theta plus nine um where does the three come from so the three is the a value so this is the form of square root of x squared plus a squared and the a being three because we have x squared plus nine in the square root over here so we had a so in the given function, we had a x squared plus nine. So the nine 
is a three square, right? It tells us this is three. Um, and to continue this, that's a nine tangent squared theta plus one. So that's a, again, we can use the identity to rewrite tangent squared plus one, that's a secant squared. And then the next step is taking square root of this because in the integral, we get a square root of x squared plus nine. I'm just gonna do, I'm just doing the work on the side so that when I plug into the integral, not too many terms. Um, so that's a square root of nine secant squared theta, which is three secant theta. Again, we're gonna take it positive. So it should be absolute value, but we only consider the positive here. Um, if you don't believe me, um, you can, maybe I should explain that why it's positive. Um, so in this example, we have with we given, x is from zero to one, right? That's what the integral says, x is from zero to one. And then we note, note we have, so x equals three tangent theta, that's the substitution we use. So tangent theta is equal to x over three. So that means tangent theta is from zero over three to one over three. That's what the, the, the range of tangent theta is. So that's, that's just from zero to one third. That's what tangent theta is. And if you think about tangent graph, it looks like this. This is the graph of tangent. If we only consider tangent value from zero to one third, In this part, this is zero, this is pi over two. If you're not familiar with this, this could be confusing. So if the tangent is from zero to one third, the secant has to be from zero to pi in this, in the graph I have. And if you recall that from zero to two, zero to pi over two, so theta is from, zero to pi over two, that means the cosine in this part is positive. So therefore secant is positive. And the secant. Therefore in this part, we're just gonna take directly three secant theta because based on the x value given, the secant theta is positive. It's not negative. So we just take the positive. And now I'm gonna go back to the integral because I have all the parts that I could substitute in there into the integral. So the integral I have x cubed in the, in the numerator, dx on the right, and then square root cubed in the denominator. So I'm gonna why are we setting them equal to each other? Um, Sam, do you mean the part that I have, um, like, this part is that why you're confusing it says given x is from um, zero to one. Okay, that entire part. So let me kind of explain this. So, so normally when you take a square root, right, you get square root, you get absolute value of what you take square root of because square root always give you a positive value. Like for example, if I say square root of nine, that's just three it's not gonna be negative, right? But if I have a square root of um, x squared, you have to be careful. It should be absolute value of x. If x is positive, that's gonna be x. If x is negative, then it's not x anymore, right? So it should be absolute value of x if you don't know what x is. So here we had a, a square root of nine secant squared. 
So that should be three absolute value secant theta because we don't know if that's positive or negative. Okay. So what I did next is to find out what it is because it's a definite integral. So we have to be a little more careful. Um, so I said, just look at the integral given. It's from zero to one. So x is from zero to one, that's what's given. In that part, I can figure out tangent theta. Because x is from zero to one, I can figure out tangent theta. So I just divide by three to get tangent theta is x over three. That's coming from here, same expression, I didn't change it. So I get tangent theta equals x over three. Because x is from zero to one, so that means tangent theta will be from zero to three, zero over three to one third. So that's a zero to one third. That's the, the range of tangent theta based on x. And if you go back to the graph of tangent, if you just think about the graph of tangent theta, if the tangent theta is from zero to three, then the angle will be from zero to pi over two in that part. That's the corresponding interval of angle that will give you tangent is from zero to one third. And if the angle is from zero to pi over two, that means the cosine is always positive in that range. And then the secant is always positive because secant is one over cosine. If cosine is positive, the secant will be positive. So what that means is that from, for x is from zero to one, the secant is always gonna be positive in that, in that interval of x value. Now, how is it from, uh, how does it go to pi over two? I'm so kind of confused on that, from zero to one over three. How is that turning to pi over two? Well, not exactly to pi over two, it's less than pi over two, right? Because this is a tangent graph, if you recall that. This is a pi over two. If you think about the, the graph of tangent theta, and the, here we have, this is tangent theta equals zero, and the, this is tangent theta equals one third. And the, the angle that will give you those, the, the tangent between them, the angle will be from zero to some number less than pi over two, but it doesn't matter here. We can just go all the way to pi over two to make it easy. So that's what I meant. The tangent theta from zero to one third, that, those are like the y values of tangent graph. And then we want to know what the range of theta is in that part. So tangent theta goes to pi over two? No, tangent theta is, has value from zero to one third. The theta, so this is theta value. Theta will have value from zero to pi over two. It's actually from zero to a number less than pi over two, but we can just ex expand that theta to make it a little bit bigger because anywhere between any of those theta values, we just want to know what cosine and the secant values are, whether they're positive or negative. That's all we care about. So for any tangent value that's from zero to one third, the corresponding angles will be between zero to pi over two. This is like if you have a function y equals f of x, if you know the y values, you can figure out the corresponding x values, right? So here we know the tangent theta is from zero to one third. We can figure out the corresponding angles, which is between zero and a pi over two, to, or zero to some number less than pi over two. So that's why I wrote. So the theta is, is somewhere between zero and a pi over two. And in that part, cosine, if we know the theta is from zero to pi over two, the cosine, if you think about the cosine graph, the cosine is always positive in that part. Because the cosine graph 
looks like this. So the cosine is positive for angle from zero to pi over two. That means the secant has to be positive because secant is just one over cosine. If cosine is positive, secant will be positive. I'm sorry, but I'm still not seeing the correlation to one over three to pi over two. Well, like, one how does one over three? Pi over two. One over three doesn't go to pi over two. One over three as a tangent value goes to some value less than pi over two. But it doesn't matter. We, we look at, so you could use the calculator, right? To figure out what that is. Doesn't matter what that number is, that angle is gonna be less than pi over two. But doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's between zero and a pi over two, we can still expand that range, uh, expand that interval of theta values to all the way to pi over two, because anywhere between zero and a pi over two, the cosine behave the same way, sine behave the same way, the tangent behave the same way. Um, they all have, they're either gonna be positive or negative. They're always gonna be the same in that, in that part. So you, you, you can put in the calculator that you can still see, oh, it's from zero to some angle, but it doesn't matter what it is. As long, remember that we try to figure out whether secant is positive or negative in this case. That's, that's what we need when we take a square root, right? So, so that's, that's all we do. We try to do all this work to figure out whether secant is positive or negative, which means is cosine positive or negative in that part. How do we know if cosine is positive or negative? Well, we have to know what the angle is in that part. And how do we know what the angle is? Well, we use the value of tangent um, to figure out what the angle is, the, the interval of the angle. And then we can conclude whether the, whether the cosine is positive or negative. It's not about, we're not finding the exact value of cosine or secant. Oh, we're not so, we're not interested in solving what the angle is exactly, but we just need to know where it is and the whether it give us a positive or negative cosine in the secant. So in this part, we end up with secant is positive in this case. That means that when we took the square root earlier, we end up with a positive secant theta, not a negative. So I would say probably spend a little bit more time later on this part. There's a couple more examples in the book. Um, if this example doesn't make sense to you, let me know and uh, we, we can look at another example together. This, you only have to do this when you have in when you have a definite integral. When you have indefinite integral, you're just assuming it's positive. And from here, I'm gonna go back to the integral I had, which is integrating zero to one of x cubed, which is three tangent theta, that's what x is cubed. And the denominator we have square root part cubed. The square root part is three secant, so we get three secant theta cubed. Then we have a dx, which is three secant squared theta d theta. And from this point, we just have to try to simplify and try to um, integrate. Uh, 
So that's integral from zero to one, three cubed, 27 tangent cubed theta over 27 secant cubed theta. And then we have three secant squared theta d theta. So that's 27 cancels, secant squared, cancel with uh, one of, two of the secant in the denominator. And then that's from zero to one, three goes to the front, tangent cubed, secant d theta. The, the numerator cubed because we had an x cubed in the numerator. And the denominator is cubed because we have a cube of the square root. So both numerator and denominator are cubed. And from here, how do we um, integrate this? You could turn everything into sine and a cosine. and divide by secant. Secant is one over cosine, d theta, and then you can try to carry out the integration from there. So if I rewrite this, so that will be, three integral from zero to one. I get sine cubed divided by cosine cubed, but then I have dividing, dividing by one over cosine, so multiply by the reciprocal, so that's cosine over one. So we got cosine squared theta d theta. At this point, I'm going to try the trick because the power of science is so I'm going to save a sign. So that's a three integral. Zero to one sine squared theta, save a sign on the side. Put it with the D theta and then cosine squared. And then we can rewrite sine squared with uh, one minus cosine squared to get three integral zero to one, one minus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta, sine theta d theta. If you recall that by saving a sine aside, we can use u substitution. So that u equals cosine theta, du equals negative sine theta d theta, or negative du equals sine theta. So substitution again. So we get three integrating zero to one. Those are the x values. So we got one minus u squared divided by u squared negative du so negative three. And uh, if you find it difficult to integrate, just separate the fraction. That's negative three from zero to one, one over u squared minus one du. If done correctly, the integral will be uh, one over u squared, that will give you negative one over u minus one is negative. You multiply by its sign. Are you um are you talking about this part? Um I'm not multiplied by a sign there. So what I did is I I had a sine cubed. So I split the sine cubed into a sine square and a sign.
So that's because the power of sine is odd. So I'm going to save a sine for, for U substitution later. Um, and then remember that X value is from zero to one. So we have to try to find the X value or we can try to find the interval of U, whichever is easy for you. Um, to do. In this case, you can go from x, find theta, solve for u, and then plug in the u value, or you take the function and then rewrite it in terms of theta, in terms of x, whichever is easy. Um, so what I did is um, I rewrite everything in terms of theta. So u is cosine theta, so I get negative three distribute in there. So I get three over u, so that's three cosine theta. Negative three times negative u, that's a positive three u, so that's a three cosine theta. From x equals zero to x equals one. But then I have to go back to figure out what cosine theta is. Now I'll go back all the way to the right triangle we had. I'm gonna redraw it. So recall the right triangle plus theta x three. So we can pick up this side as x squared plus nine cosine theta will be from will be three over square root of um, x squared plus nine. That's cosine. So we get three over cosine. So that's three over three over square root of x squared plus nine plus three times three over so square root of x squared plus nine. Evaluate it from zero to one. And then the rest follows. This example is taking a while, but it's a, it's a very good example. Um, So that's an extra step here. So that's what I did. It's probably confusing to a lot of people. Um, it's this part. Everything I did in this part is, um, is to decide when we take a square root of nine secant squared, we need to know if that absolute value of secant theta is gonna be positive or is it negative? Because if you remember, long time ago, you have that simple, simpler case, square, square root of x squared, it's always going to be positive, but we don't know what x is. So that's going to be absolute value of x, which is equal to x if x is positive, or negative x if x is negative. depends on what x is. So when we take a square root of secant squared, we have to do the same thing. We have to figure out whether secant theta um, is positive or is it negative. That's what the, the work we did by looking at the interval of x values. The examples you're gonna come across in homework or on the future assessments, probably just gonna be positive. I'm, I'm gonna, th there are examples that will be involving negative um, after you take a square root, but you probably wouldn't come across them on assessments. But you should still know what I'm doing here, um, or at least try to understand it, the logic behind this part. And after that, you have to um, rewrite the integral using um, theta, just like we have done before, integrate it using um, all the techniques that we know and then evaluate it at the end. Any questions on this example? How did you get from in terms of theta in terms of x? I'm still a little confused on that part. So 
So you were asking about from this step go there, with from theta function to the x function, right? Yeah. So that's use, using the relationship we had earlier at the very beginning. So at the very beginning, when we set substitution, we say, oh, x equals three tangent theta, right? For this, if we have a square root of x squared plus three squared, that's the substitution we use. And then that substitution coming from this right triangle setup, having x on the opposite side and the three on the adjacent, so that right triangle is important to convert from theta to x at the end. So what I did is I took the same right triangle. So I have theta, I have x is opposite, three is adjacent. And I found that I have hypotenuse for that right triangle, which is square root of x squared plus nine. So I'm gonna I use that right triangle there. So I look at it. The, the antiderivative I have have a cosine, so I need to find cosine in terms of x. So I did that by using the right triangle. Cosine theta using the right triangle is adjacent side over hypotenuse. That's a three over square root of x squared plus nine. So that's what cosine theta is in terms of x. And then I go back to put it into the antiderivative. Um, for cosine theta altogether. So when the, at the end, when you go from the, the theta function to the x function, you have to use the right triangle um, that you used at the beginning. Good question. Any other questions? Anyway, um, I'm gonna stop here today. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of exercise problems on this topic you can work on um, after the exam. Um, again, you're gonna have about one week to work on it. So hopefully as you work on those practice problems, it's gonna make a little bit more sense. I'll, uh, I'll find a couple of examples like this for you to, um, to try on your own. All right. Um, Definitely, definitely spend some time um, study for the exam. Um, if you have not have not finished the previous homework, um, work on it. Um, that will help you prepare for the exam. Um, other than that, I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Have a good day, professor. Thank you. Take care.